You know, we live in a, we're in a nation now that's divided. And God gave me a word several months ago that I really didn't have an understanding of until now. Uh, in the context of current events, I really understand what he was trying to, to tell me. And he was talking about the fallacy of uh, the wisdom of men. And how unreliable it is. So I want you to turn to 1 Corinthians. Uh, um, it's a misprint on your bulletin notes. It's not 2 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, uh, starting in verse 1. And if you will, let's stand for the reading of the word. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you and praise you to live in a nation where, where your people still pray, where they still believe, where when they repent and deal with their own sin and come back to you, that you begin to move in their circumstance. And we thank you that we serve a God who will not allow his people to be oppressed forever. That sooner or later, God, you begin to shake things. That when your people are oppressed, when they're persecuted, when, when, they are, when they're ostracized because of their commitment to you and your kingdom, you tolerate it for a while, but then you send Moses. You, you, you put up with it for a little while, and then you send Jesus. Then you do something to begin to shake circumstances to remove the oppression from your people. I believe that's what we just stepped into. I thank you for that, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray you anoint this word and heal hearts, heal our nation. And we ask it in Jesus' name, and everyone said, amen, amen. Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 1, he said, And I, brethren, when I came to you, did not come with excellence of speech or of wisdom, declaring to you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. See, I think that helps so much. If we just decide we're not going to know anything except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, and my speech was, and my speech and my preaching were not with persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the Spirit and of the power. That your faith should not be in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. However, we speak wisdom among those who are mature, yet not the wisdom of this age, nor the rulers of this age who are coming to nothing. But we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages for our glory. May God add his blessing to the reading of the word. You may be seated. <coughs> we live in a nation basically of red states and blue states. And <coughs> if you look close at the map, and I, I want to say one other thing, too, that might help you. Chuck Colson used to say this often. Uh, and you know the story of Chuck Colson. He was involved in the Nixon administration and so on and so forth, got convicted, went to prison, found Jesus, became a radical disciple of Jesus, very effective. And he used to say that the Savior is not coming on Air Force One. I really don't care who won the presidency. I'm going to tell you who's in charge. Jesus Christ is in charge. Can I get a witness out of somebody? Because he paid the price to be in charge. And he is in charge, and there really are no other names. There are no other authorities that are above his. And there's going to come a time when whether you believe him or not, don't make any difference. Every knee is going to bow and every tongue is going to confess. Amen? That's what I know. Now, I don't know how that's going to happen or when that's going to happen. I just know that it is going to happen. And so until then, there are, there are battles in the heavenly. See, we don't war against flesh and blood. We have to understand this. We don't war against flesh and blood, but we war against principalities and darkness in the heavenlies and forces that are spiritual. That's what we as Christians war against. We don't war against Democrats. We don't war against Republicans. We don't war against anyone in the flesh. We war against that darkness that's trying to grip the earth and has been ever since Adam fell in the garden. That's what we war against. And so we war in a spiritual way. In a divided nation, basically what you're seeing in this nation called America is you're seeing a dichotomy between the rural <coughs> and the urban. You're seeing a migration because of economics. People have had to migrate from the rural areas of our nation into the urban areas. 
There's a term for it. It's called urbanization. And it's happening throughout the world. The United Nations says half the world's population lived in urban areas by the year 2008. And they further predicted that by 2050, about 64% of the developing world and 86% of the developed world will live in an urbanized area. So people and their culture begin to take on the characteristic of their environment. I know that you have a very low opinion of Arabs and devout Islamists. But when you live in a harsh environment, you develop a harsh personality. I found this true, man. I, I can be around cowboys. They live out in the middle of the desert. Those dudes are different. They, they have a different aspect of their personality. We begin to take on the attributes of the environment in which we're living. And so as we move to the t city, we begin to change. Our cultural values begin to change. And the basic premise of all of this word here is that God is nothing if he is not a creator. This is the thing. God, I always I told the youth this when we were up in the mountains, you know, you need to go wherever God's will is. That's where you're going to feel the power. That's where you're going to feel the peace. That's where you're going to feel the presence of God. And one of the places you can go, and wherever God's will is unimpeded, that's where the kingdom is. Jesus could not make Pontius Pilate understand that. Where is your kingdom? I don't show me on the map. It's not physical. It manifests wherever, not my will, but thy will. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Wherever the will of God is the preeminent thing, that's where you see the kingdom of God manifest. And one of the interesting places that you can go to and find the kingdom of God is in nature. Animals have no will to violate the will of God. There is no obstacle to the will of God in nature. And so people go to nature and they feel good and they come back and they don't know that they feel good because they've been in the presence of the king. That's where his kingdom is operating because man has limited impact on the natural. And so when you grow up in a rural country like we do, you go to a church surrounded by cornfields. When you grow up in a rural environment, even if you live in town, that reminds me of uh, <laughs> Kenneth White, the great Western artist, told a story about one time he likes to go around through the country and take pictures of barns or maybe horse scenes or cows grazing, something to inspire his painting. And he was driving around early one morning and he came to a little community there called Wayside. I don't know how many of you have been to Wayside, amen? Wayside, the big city of Wayside. Wayside is basically just a wayside. It's just a spot on the side of the road, Amen. And so this was back a long time ago, and they had a little co-op station there. And back in the days when they used to have an attendant, you kids don't remember this, but believe this or not, you used to go to a gas station, and a guy would run out and ask if he could fill your car up. And so he pulls into this little co-op gas station at Wayside, and a young man comes out, and it's a beautiful fall morning, beautiful fall morning. And a young man comes out, and he says, can I fill your car up, mister? He says, yeah, would you? He gets out, Kenneth gets out of his car, and he takes a deep breath, and he says, man, you know how blessed you are to live in the country. And the kid goes, uh, well, I wouldn't know about that. Mr. said, I've lived here in Wayside my whole life. Amen? So there's, you can actually live in a small town, and you really are living in the country. I don't know, you know, if you've never been to Dallas or Fort Worth, trust me, it's different. Can I get a witness out of somebody? Even if you live in Hereford, and Hereford's got to be kind of a bustling place as God's begin to restore our economy, and, you know, there's trucks on the road. Take, you cross 385, and, you know, you take your life in your, your own hands when you do that. There's so much traffic, but, but still it's a small rural place. And so my point is, is that in the, in the environment of a rural America, God as a creator is a very easy concept to grab a hold of. You can look around, and you know what you see is miraculous. Well, what happens, and so it's easy to relate to God and who he is. God becomes the center of your cultural life. Now, I didn't say church did. I said God did. Now, what happens when you move to an urban area is you find yourself in a place where everything around you is man-made. Everything. From the buildings, and they're beautiful, to the streets and the highways, 
If there is a tree somewhere, somebody planted it. Nothing occurs naturally in an urban area. Everything is man-made. And you find yourself in an environment where all you see is man- I was I was I was so staggered the first time we took our youth to the mountains. A lot of them had never seen the mountains. Man, they love it. That's all they want to do is go back to the mountains. My point is, is that, and we took some kids from Fort Worth on that first trip, and they had never been to any place like that. It's, it, it changed their whole concept of reality. So what happens when you have a generation that leaves the farm and goes into the urban areas because of economics? After about two generations of living in a man-made environment, you get to where you don't know who God is. And now you've got division. You've got people in the city that see things entirely different than people in the country. My brother-in-law is an engineer for Kimber, a great firearm manufacturer. But before that, he was an engineer for a, another manufacturing company there that made parts for Caterpillar Motors. And he's lived in an urban area his whole life, and they, they live just outside of New York City. When my brother and sister live, brother-in-law and sister live, you can see the Independence Tower from their house. And he used to come out here, and we get in arguments about gun control. He would say, you know, we got to have gun control. Man, I'm telling you, we got kooks walking around with guns, la da 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 And I finally convinced him. I said, Reuben, listen to me. My daughter sits in an office, and it would take a deputy sheriff at least 20 minutes to get out there. And if somebody comes out there and decides he's going to harm her, I want her to be armed. She can explain to the cops what happened whenever they get there. Can I get a witness out of somebody? We just live in an environment where the police are just not accessible. They're not everywhere. It takes a This is a huge county. Someone who lives in the northwest section of this county, it would take our great, we have a great police department. We have great sheriff's office. We have great deputies. It would take them a half an hour to get out there. Can I get a witness out of somebody? See how your, your viewpoint on that particular issue can be completely different? You're interested in protection. Now, it's interesting to me that once he got a job working for Kimber, his whole viewpoint and all that all changed. And now he's like, you know, man, we can't have gun control. I mean, we got to have, everybody needs a firearm, and I have to have some for sale. Hallelujah. In fact, he developed a new pistol for Kimber. They say that's killer, that's in testing, that's going to come out. And uh, he's promised me he would sell me one probably for two or $3,000. You know how that is. He's Jewish. I forgot to mention that to you. Amen. So... He's going to make some money on something. But my point is, is you see how we're beginning to split as a nation because of this migration and this earth. I didn't say there's nobody in big cities that knows Jesus. I'm just saying the culture there is different. Do you get where I'm going with this? And you can't change that. But see, the, 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 the political, social, and cultural division that's in America is also reflected in our electorate. In our electoral system, there's only been four times when the person who was running won the popular vote and lost the electoral vote. It happened twice in the 1800s, and it's happened twice in the past 16 years. 2000 Al Gore and 2016 Hillary Clinton. And so you're starting to see this, this, you go to the urban areas and they overwhelmingly voted one way. You come into the country and they overwhelmingly vote another way, and we, we can't figure out what's wrong with those idiots in the city. I'm telling you, they're in an environment that's different than yours. And they see things differently than you do. But here's what I'm here to tell you this morning. It's not what, it ma- culture is not matter. what matters. Culture is not what matters. Truth is what matters. Truth is what matters. And I don't care if you're living in a matrix. If you press in and seek truth, you know what you'll find? You'll find Jesus Christ. If you can get past that mirage you're living in that, that is so filled with culture and a way of looking at things and say, I'm going to examine everything in my life to make sure that it's based on truth, here's what you discover. Jesus Christ is the answer. Jesus Christ is the truth. In John 1.17, it says, For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. I love what it says in Colossians 2.3, In whom Christ, in whom all hidden are are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I don't care if you're a physicist. We talked about this. 
Physicists are starting to wake up and say, man, there has to be a creator in the universe. There's just this order. All wisdom and knowledge begins with Jesus Christ. So if you want to see things the way they really are, you've got to come to Christ first. You can't substitute your idols for him and expect not to be deceived and to be subject to a lie. There are a lot of people that are, that are seeing, not seeing reality. They're seeing a lie. And this is what Mark Twain said, a lie can travel around the world while truth's just getting its shoes tied. I've never seen anything that spreads as fast as a lie. Have you? It's why it's such a brilliant strategy of the enemy. He is the great deceiver, the father of all lies. And so he keeps people in a deceived state. And he keeps this division that comes through this urbanization process. The problem is when you live in a man-made environment is you forget in whose image you are made. And you begin to believe that you can live by bread alone. I got news for you. You can't live by bread alone. You can only live by every, wor every word that comes out of the mouth of God. That's what will sustain you. That's what will keep you. Nietzsche, the great German philosopher, said God is dead. He accused man of fabricating a concept that he needed to cope with difficulty. And finally, him and his atheist buddies, atheist philosophers, finally convinced enough people in the ruling aristocracy of Europe that God was dead, that they begin to believe it, that God was just a concept. See, the problem is, in Nietzsche's own life, whenever he got towards the end of it, he contemplated suicide constantly. There's a darkness in the heart of an atheist. That's why you don't ever give up witnessing to them, amen? There comes a point in time when they know there's something wrong. There comes a point in time when they realize that they put all of their hope in their own reasoning. They put all of their value in their own ability to believe a certain way, to, to believe that they were in charge, to believe that they controlled their own destiny. That will work for a while, but eventually they realize there's an emptiness in their heart and that they have to have God. The problem is you can stay deceived for a long time before you get to that place. Can I get a witness out of somebody? So the divide in America, when you boil it down, is spiritual. It's really spiritual. I've explained the forces that have created it. But there's a direct split in America, those who believe and follow Jesus and those that do not. If you believe that, say amen. I have some encouraging news for you this morning. Number one is division never bothered the Lord. He said in Matthew 10, 34 and 35, don't think that I came to bring you peace. I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set man against father and daughter against mother and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. I came here not to bring division, but to bring separation. I came here to separate you from the world. I came to separate the damned from the saved. I came to separate those who are in the kingdom from those that are in the world. I came to separate non-followers from followers. I didn't say believers. There's a lot of people that believe in Jesus that are not following him. Can I get a witness out of somebody? James said, so you believe in Jesus, you do well. Even the demons fear and believe in fear and tremble. It's not enough to believe him. You have to follow him. So the followers of Jesus are being sorted out and separated from the world, and Jesus never worried about that. See, he never sought popularity. You have to get this. I wish the modern church would get this. It's not about crowds. It's about disciples. I don't care how many people come to your church, how many of them are really following Jesus, living for him, making a difference, being a witness, affecting their community because of the commitment that they have made to his kingdom. How many? Because you can fill up a crowd. My, my spiritual father used to tell me, if it's just about the crowd guy, why don't you get P.T. Barnum to come out here and have a circus? you got a unique facility. Just have a circus and a parade and do whatever you can do. But know this, when you start drawing people to your church just to build a crowd, you're going to have to come up with something bigger and better every week to keep them entertained. You'll vouch for the fact I'm not much of an entertainer. I'm not interested in entertaining you. I'm interested in saving you, sozo, getting you fixed, repaired, and made like you're supposed to be in the image of the God who created you and doing what he called you to do. That's what I'm interested in. That's what it is to be an apprentice to the master, someone who does what he did, 
someone who is having an impact that he had. And he never worried about the crowds. It says in John, the second chapter, it says that, that they said, Hosanna, Hosanna, when he came to Jerusalem. And he says, but he refused to entrust himself to them because he knew men's hearts. He knew that same crowd that was crying, Hosanna, would be crying, crucifying by the time he got to the end of the chapter. And he didn't care. Here's what he knew. He knew the twelve. He knew the 12 could affect history. The 12 could change circumstance. The 12 could have an impact on the world that would change its whole course. The 12 is who he invested in. He preached to the crowds, but he discipled the 12. And the only reason he preached to the crowds was because they showed up and they had real need. The only reason he healed them was because he had compassion. He wasn't trying to show off. The only reason he cast demons out of them is he wanted them to be free. But even when he did, he knew that very few of them would come back. You remember the, remember the lepers? Healed all of them. One came back. He said, where are the rest of them? I've seen so many people get a miraculous healing from God and go right after the devil. God is looking for people that are committed to him and to his kingdom. He's not looking for big crowds. He didn't come to build unity. He came to bring division, to separate, to sort his people out from everybody else. He's never sought popularity. He never, what he sought is commitment. He's looking for, I said this before, I'll say it again. God is looking for a few good men, semper fidelis. He's looking for, for those that are forever faithful. No matter what the circumstance, they're committed to him and they're committed to his kingdom. Oz Guinness says he's looking for impossible people that refuse to compromise. Never, ever trade truth for unity. Let me, let me say that again. Never trade truth for unity. That's what a lot of people do. They want to make everybody happy. This is the mistake of the Western church. I hate to tell you this, and if you're struggling with this spirit, I love you, and I can help you. We'll take you through deliverance. Homosexuality is a sin. It's in the book. I didn't say it was, and I'm not offended at you. Because I got sin too, and I need to worry about my sin, not yours. But if you're, instead of compromising and telling you everything is okay because we need to keep the numbers up, let's tell them the truth and set them free and see if that doesn't make a difference. Come on. Let's see if we don't take them someplace where they feel so free they refuse to go back into Egypt. They need freedom. Yeah, they need love. And that's the other thing too. Listen, Jesus was about love. God is love. If you're in God, you love. But he's also... He, through Christ came grace and truth. Too many people want to compromise truth just to say that they're walking in love. Man, that's not love. And do I really love you if I don't tell you that you're in sin and that I'm praying for you and I want to help you, but you need to repent? Is that real love? Do you, do you, do you, care? Do you care if people lose their souls because they refuse to compromise. They refuse to change the way they're living. Isn't that love to help them to say, I'm not judging you, brother. I want to help you. John 6, said, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. In John 8, 32 John, Jesus said in John 8, one of my favorite chapters, he said, abide in my word. My words are spirit in their life. Abide in my word, you'll know the truth, and the truth will make you free. I'm telling you what we're seeing. We're seeing the shaking that we've talked about in the past has begun. When God's people are oppressed, a shaking is coming. In Exodus 3, 7, God sent uh, Moses, and he said, surely I have seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt that types the world and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrow. God's people have cried out against the oppression of secular humanism. Let me tell you what that is. That is this modern idea of the progressives that you don't need God, Nietzsche. You don't need God anymore. You're, you're a God. It's, it's, so it's, it's based on the premise that the whole universe revolves around you. I'm going to tell you something. The universe revolves around Jesus Christ. It don't revolve around you. And when it becomes truth, becomes relative. Well, you know, my truth may be different than your truth. Let me tell you something about truth. Truth is truth. And whether you like it or not is irrelevant. It's in here. This is true. Jesus' words are truth. They're truth. And that's got to be the basis of your whole life. If you build your life on truth, here's what he says. You'll know real freedom. 
God's people are tired of having the values assaulted by abortion and gay marriage and the progressive sexual agenda and, and all of the stuff that we're told is none of your business but out that's rotting our culture from the inside out. They're tired of a Supreme Court that neither knows God nor fears him. They're tired, man. They're tired. Those that are followers of Jesus have been oppressed. We've been told to shut up. I've gotten letters that they have sent me that told me, you watch what you preach from your pulpit or we'll revoke your tax-free status, and that's an absolute truth. And I'm not the only one. I'm telling you, I love people who are confused about their sexuality. They're just confused. They don't know who they are, but I'm not going to stand and say it's okay because I'm afraid I'll lose my tax-free status if I don't tell you the truth about homosexuality. What kind of a minister would I be? I'm answerable to Jesus when I get to heaven for the things that I've taught. All through, peop all through history, when God's people have been oppressed, God has sent a shaking. Haggai 2, 6 and 7. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it's a little while. I'm going to shake the heaven. I'm going to shake the earth, the sea, and the dry land. I will shake all the nations, and they shall come to the desire of all nations, and I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. This assault on God and his people by the human secularist movement <clears throat> does not diminish God's glory. It provokes it. It causes him to move. They, they're, they're, they're about to witness, they've already started to witness things they don't understand because they're impossible to the natural mind. And the rise of the remnant church has begun. Haggai 2, 2 and 5, speak now to the remnant of my people. He told the prophets, speak to the remnant of my people and say to them, be strong, be strong, all of you people that are in the land. He didn't say in, in the land. He said, be strong. According to the word that I coveted, am I not with you, says the Lord of hosts? According to the word I coveted to you when you came out of Egypt, that types the world. When you got saved, God made a deal with you. He said, if you'll follow me, I'll lead you places that you never dreamed about. I'll make your life successful. I'll protect you. I'll take care of you. Have I not coveted with you? And is my spirit not still among you? And then he goes on to say, get to work. Get to work. Start living for me. Show them what it is to live for Jesus. My remnant people, he says, my remnant people, it shall go well with you in spite of what you see, in spite of the persecution you endure, you know this, it's going to go well with you. A remnant, leftovers, remnant carpet sale, you know what that means? All of the roll left, but one piece. When you gather remnant cows off ranches on the Canadian River, you better be a cowboy because those sisters have decided they're not leaving, they're staying there, and they ain't going anywhere, and they sure ain't going to follow the rest of those cows onto the truck to the slaughterhouse. Cavness is not going to be where they're going. They're staying where they are in that brush, and they're going to camp out and going to take care of their youngins. And if you think that a remnant cow won't take care of her babies, just go try to sort one off. See, this is the remnant church. We have not left the word. We're not leaving the word. We're not going the way of the rest of the ones that compromise the word. We're staying in the word. We're not leaving. We're camping out. Nothing can drive us off the word of God. This is the remnant church. He said, you tell them something for me, prophet. You tell them. It's going to go well with you. I know you're dealing with things. I know that you have issues in your life, but I'm here to declare to you, if you refuse to compromise on the word of God, if you stay in the remnant church and you believe God and continue to pray, it's going to turn out good. It's going to turn out good. This is the church that's going to usher in the next great awakening. There's another revival coming. Man, I've, 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 I've talked to preachers that said, I don't see it, God. It's not in the Bible anywhere. So I said, well, think of it this way. Jesus is going to come, and he's going to end all of it. The day's going to be whether you're in or you're out. And the God of mercy and the God of love and a God who died for you and for me, and for sinners. While we were yet sinners, man, he died for us. That same God is just going to show up, and there's not going to be any revival in the church. He's going to say, too late for you, man. I gave you all that time. I'm telling you, the Spirit of God is going to fall on the church. You're going to see people healed, saved, delivered, raised from the dead, demons cast out. You're going to see the power of the Holy Spirit flowing through the church again, the remnant church, the remnant church. The steeple ain't over the building. It's in some guy's front yard. Hallelujah. They don't care. They don't care about a steeple. They'll meet in a shopping center. They'll meet in a, they'll meet in a barn. They'll meet any. They are the remnant church. They still believe in the power of God. They're living according to the power of God, according to his promises. Stay 
standing on them, and the power of God is flowing through them, and they're going to draw them like flies to honey. You're going to see the power of the church rise up one more time before Jesus comes back. You're going to see the next great awakening is going to happen. You're going to witness it. You're going to be part of it. You're going to be caught up in the middle of it. I know Brother Jim used to tell me he was involved in the charismatic movement when it first broke out. His church in Louisiana, it was a Baptist church. The power of God moved. People started getting healed. They even started talking in some funny languages. The Baptists told them to quit it. They told the Baptists to get lost. We're not going anywhere. We're going we're to maintain this. We're going to pursue this and see where this goes. He said we had people come that had sickness in their body that had been told by the doctors, man, there's no way. He said we had healing services on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. I couldn't get people. He said we couldn't get people to leave the church building. We couldn't get people to get out and go home so we can clean up. People came in continuously, stagger off the street, prostitutes, high on heroin, staggering into that place because they heard that there was some way they could get free from what was the demons. And they would come in there and they would bring them to the front and they would do deliverance ministry on them right there and they would get set free and become leaders in the church. Prostitutes make the best leaders. Jesus said, he who has been forgiven much also loves much. Hallelujah. They were attracting people. They didn't run any ads. They didn't have no, they didn't have no special classes. They didn't have, they didn't have slick uh, uh, worship. They didn't have it. They just showed up. The power of God showed up. And he said, I've never seen anything like it. So here's what I'm here to declare to you. I want the Holy Spirit to move in the Baptist church. I want the Holy Spirit to move in the Methodist church. I want the Holy Spirit to move in the God help us in the Presbyterian church. Would that be something to see the power of God move in there? You know what I want? That's what I want. I, I, don't, want, I, don't, want, I don't want to be the exclusive church. I want to see the Spirit of God move in all of the church. Because my spiritual mentor told me, he said, don't make the mistake of making it about you. Man, I don't know where this comes from. I wasn't even going to share about this. I think God is trying to warn us. He's about to do something in our midst. And we need to be careful about going and saying, God's at Barn Church. i got news for you. God is everywhere. He's everywhere. All you've got to do is say, just open your heart. You want us to come to your church service and pray for God to move in your church? We want the anointing to spread. The remnant, you're going to usher in the next great revival. If my people call by my name, will humble themselves and pray, seek my face. Nothing makes people get on their knees like a drought in the rural areas. We've been on our knees in this country for several years, and God has healed our drought, and look at what all he's done, and now the rest of it is coming, hallelujah. The shaking is coming. The remnant church, the spirit of God is about to flow. We're about to see powerful, powerful things happen. But I want to get back to the difference between the prophetic word and the wisdom of men. Prophetic words are God's authorization and his warning. Reconciling God's prophetic word to this generation, there are two important concepts. The shaking. He said, the shaking is coming, but tell the remnant it'll do well, I'll do well with them. And he gave me a word personally, and I sent it out to some of you. I sent it to Roger and Bill. About two months ago, he told me, he said, I'm about to expose the fallacy of human wisdom. Well, see, I didn't have any natural understanding. I thought the markets were going to collapse because the Federal Reserve is keeping this market propped up artificially through the wisdom of men. They all got degrees from Harvard Business School and all of that, and it's not working anymore. So I, I was convinced that's what it was. I didn't have any idea of the depth of it until I, I got a hold of a video clip from a guy named Lance Walnow. He's a pastor in Keller, Texas. And he had a prophetic word out of Isaiah 45. And I just want to preface this by saying this. I don't really like Donald Trump. He doesn't stand for any values that I really, really esteem. When you tell me that it's all about family and you've been married three times, what you're really saying is is about the kids that you've had by the various women that you've married. Amen? I mean, to me, family, Carol, when I say it's about family, she's an important part of that. She's kind of the linchpin, if you know what I'm saying. So, so I don't want you to get what I'm saying here wrong. I don't see any fruit in his life that I would call Christian, a follower of Jesus. 
And that's why a lot of you voted against him, and I know you did, and I'm okay with that. Because we're supposed to vote for people, but the other one, I mean, I don't want to go there. That's not what I'm about this morning. That's not, I'm not trying to, I'm trying to get you to see this. So, so, so Lance Wildnow came up with this prophecy out of Isaiah 45. I want you to turn to Isaiah 45. And I've, I've shared this with some of you, but I want to, I want to show you how it relates to all these other words that we've been given. Isaiah 45, starting in verse 1. <clears throat> Thus says the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have held, to subdue nations before him and to loose the armor of kings and to open up before him the double doors so that the gates will not be shut. In other words, he didn't have access to something. And I will go before you and make the crooked places straight. I will break the pieces of the gates of bronze. I'll cut the bars of iron. I will give you the treasures of darkness and the hidden riches of secret places that you may know that I, the Lord, who call you by name and the God of Israel. For Jacob, my servant's sake, and my and Israel, my elect, I have even called you by your name, and I have named you, though you did not even know me. And I am the Lord, and there is no other that is a God besides me. So here's what he's saying to them, to, to Cyrus. It's an interesting thing. When Isaiah got this prophetic word, and he wrote it down, Cyrus was not even born. It was a hundred years. You can oppress God's people for a while, but sooner or later, he's going to take matters into his own hand. A hundred years later, a man named Cyrus was born, a Persian. Not even in the covenant. He didn't know nothing about the temple. He didn't know nothing about nothing. He didn't even know a rabbi. But God said, I have called you by name. And I'm, and I'm, I'm appointing you to go to places that you never believed you were going to go. I'm going to put you in those places. And I'm putting you there for the, for the elect's sake, for the cause of Israel. You're going to become the king of the greatest, most powerful nation on the face of the earth. And when you get there, you're going to release the oppression off of my people, and you're going to send them back to Jerusalem to rebuild the temple. That's what you're going to do. And you don't even know it, and you're not even born yet. And whenever history shows, tells us that when Cyrus became king, Ezra the priest, he's in the book. You can go back a few books to the book of Ezra. He went to him with this prophecy, and he showed it to him and said, this was written 100 years before you were born. God says he's the one that's put you in this place. And your job now is to issue a decree to rebuild Jerusalem and to stop the oppression of God's people. You don't got to become a Jew and you don't got to get saved. You just do what God told you. It's called common grace. Lance Weil now said, Donald Trump, he said this in May of last year, when the full field was out there, my man, Ben Carson, I supported Ben Carson. They were all out there. He said, Donald Trump's going to be the president. <laughs> Are you kidding me? Because God's given me a word for the 45th president out of Isaiah 45. He's Cyrus. He's a wrecking ball for political correctness. He ain't even saved. Do you really think he's saved? I, I always love these Christians that say, oh, well, you know, he's saved. Look at the man's life. Show me some fruit. Of where he's, I don't think he's even saved. And this is what Lance Wellnow told him. He told him this. They had a meeting. So, so I want to get back. Ben Carson, my candidate, who I really believed in, man. I believe, I know the man. That brother is solid in the word. He's solid in the Holy Ghost. He's solid, solid, solid. He could, he could unite the nation. I knew that he could. He could win the black pastors and the black churches. He could win their vote. If you put him up there for candidate, I guarantee you he'd bring healing, sense, sanity, Stand up for the, for the First and the Second Amendment. All of those things. Man, he was all about that. I gave him money. I don't ever give a politician money. I gave him money. I believed in him. And then one day, he quits the race and endorses Donald Trump. What the? You finished the rest. Amber calls me. She's her, she's her guy too. She goes, what the? How could he endorse Donald Trump? Ted Cruz was still in the race. Ted Cruz is solid in the faith. I, I tell you, I kind of lost. I go, man, I was duped. 
But he prayed first. He was hearing God. He calls a meeting of pastors from all over America. They meet with Donald Trump in New York City. Lance Waldau is one of them. And they say, you know, you're kind of smelly, but we're going to go ahead and try to support you. We're going to try to get the church to support you because we know you're strong on First Amendment rights, the right of religion that's been abridged by the human secularist, trampled on. And that's the reason we're going to say. And Lance Wellner stands up and he says, you're the one and here's the reason why. And he gives him this prophecy out of Isaiah 45. You didn't, I have named you, though you have not even known me. I broke down the gates and put you in. See, the problem, and so, and so Lord, the Lord told me, he said, he said, he said, I'm about to break down. I'm about to show you the fallacy of human wisdom. And I thought it was a, I thought it was a market move, man. And I went out and shorted the S&P, and I'm still making margin calls on that position, man. I wish I had prayed more about that before I went out and did that. My point is, and everybody told you, all of the experts, all of the wisdom of men, all the MBA said if Donald Trump wins, the market's toast. It's over. It's history. It went down 800 points on election night. Carl Icahn bought a billion dollars worth of S&P futures at, eight, at down 800 points. By noon the next day, it was up 250. He got a 1,000-point move on the Dow. I mean, not S&P. He made a half a billion dollars in 24 hours just because he knew that all of this is just smoke and mirrors, man. He knew the real Donald Trump. So my point, I'm, I'm, I'm going to get to this. God uses the craziest people. Have you noticed that? He used a 14-year-old kid to slay a giant. He used a 14-year-old girl to bring Christ, a peasant girl, a nobody, to bring Christ into the world. He used a jackass to talk sense to a prophet. He uses the most unlikely most incredible things to do what his will is, and his will is to remove the oppression off of his church. There's some other things, there's a lot of things that I don't agree with, but I know this. I told everyone, so you go, well, God, why are you just now telling us this? I told Carol a hundred times. I said, let me tell you something. If Donald Trump gets elected, it'll be by the hand of God. It'll be miraculous. It won't be because I went out and talked, all the preachers talked a bunch of people into him. That ain't what I'm going to do. If he gets elected, and if this is the word of God, then it has to be by God's hand. Do you know one political pundit, Democrat or Republican, that thought he had a prayer on election night? Do you know one in the world, in the world? Do you know anybody that said, oh, he's going to win? God said, I will put you in that place. I will. Now, I got you there for a reason. The reason I hope is not so he can continue to be a racist and, a, and a, all the other things that he's been accused of, which I really don't think probably he's that much of that anyway. I think the media. And another thing, too, did we find out how counterfeit the media was? Look, I'm, I'm not, I'm not. I'm, t I'm, t I'm apolitical. I told you the Savior is not coming on Air Force One. It really doesn't matter to me. But when you have a CNN reporter submit questions to one of the candidates for review to see if she likes them before a debate, come on. I'm telling you, you can't trust in the wisdom of men. You can't trust in the media. You, can't tr you can trust in one thing, Jesus Christ and him crucified. Can I get a witness out of somebody? I don't know what God's doing. I just know that there's a shaking that's happening right now. There's going to be, I wish I was a realtor in Washington, D.C. There are going to be houses for sale everywhere. Hallelujah. I'm just telling you, I don't, I don't even, I'm not telling you I even like the guy. All I know is God has said, whether you like him or not, he's the one I'm going to use, and he's, I'm going to use him to remove the oppression off of my people. Now, get back to my guy, Ben Carson. Who I got. Look where he's sitting now. Carol told me this, or somebody told me this, when at the acceptance speech, they were, uh, Trump got up there and all the people come. He said, where's Ben? Where's Ben? Where's Ben? When a Supreme Court justice gets nominated, he's going to have to get the approval of Ben Carson. 
God put Ben Carson in a place to where he could oversee who is selected. This abortion stuff and this same-sex marriage and all this crud that we have endured that have attacked our values, and again, I'm not picking on nobody, and I'm not here to beat you up. If you had an abortion, I'm just here to tell you, God says that life is sacred. It doesn't make any difference what stage it's in. And this, this assisted suicide, man, I'm telling you, if you're a poor, if, you, if you're not on the top, you know, or middle rung of the economic ladder, man, don't vote for assisted suicide because when Medicare gets where it can't pay its bills anymore, they're going to decide, get rid of him. The sanctity and sacredness of life. Adolf Hitler believed that we needed to clean it up genetically. He was a big proponent of evolution. We need to get rid of the weak. Just kill them and get them out of the gene pool. The sanctity of life is what it's about. Now we have my man sitting at the right hand of Cyrus, the modern-day Cyrus, who was stuck there not by wisdom, not by political prognostication, not by skillful politics. Can anybody accuse this guy of being a skillful politician? No. God put him there. And he put him there to remove the oppression off of his people. Paul was a brilliant, educated theologian. And in Acts 22.3, he said, I'm indeed a Jew born in Tarsus, brought up in the city at the feet of Gamaliel, the great, great rabbi Gamaliel. Taught according to the strictness of our father's law, I was zealous towards God as you are today. But he came to understand the danger of human wisdom. He came to understand that he had to lay all that down. I stand before you. My, pre, my preach, preaching and my speech are not a persuasive words of human wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and of the power. That your faith should not be in wisdom, in the wisdom of men, but in the spirit of God. We have learned that God is doing it, and he's doing it his way. And, it, and how many of you, how many of you have prayed for our nation to repent and come back to God? Did you really think Donald Trump was going to be the one? It's just crazy enough. It has to be God. 